Um, prairie dogs are doing a little bit better than sage grouse, but they do occupy uh, across their North American range, only about 2% of what they used to occupy. Um, and again, GMP hosts the only Canadian population, aside from those in zoos. Uh, I don't know if anyone's been to the Manitoba um, the zoo in Winnipeg. There's prairie dogs that burrow out of their little enclosure. It's kind of funny to watch them. So they're just free roaming in that zoo. Um, and they're listed as threatened. They were uplisted in 2018. So they were a special concern before that, and now they're a uh, threatened species. And this is... Um, area of prairie dog colonies and so that's one of the ways that we monitor prairie dogs in Grasslands National Park. Um, the long-term average is this kind of gray dotted line in the middle there um, and it fluctuates around that a little bit but we um, have seen some pretty drastic declines and then they grow back and then um, obviously we I don't think we have the data. I think we collect that data every other year so we don't have it for 2018 um, but we know that 2018 was pretty hard on them because of the drought, so we're a little bit concerned about what we're going to see this coming summer. Um, You're right, that really does correlate with the ferret release when there was yeah. oh so many and then... Yeah, 2009 is when they were like, half. okay, we're ready to release ferrets now, and then it just crashed. Yeah. We had a plague outbreak, um, didn't help things. So mm -hmm. I'll talk very briefly about plague as well. Um, so, if I understood the purpose of this <laughs> workshop correctly, um, I think you're interested in what do you do when species habitats differ, but they occupy the same space. Um, so, sage grouse obviously like sagebrush habitat. They like lots of sagebrush, tall sagebrush, healthy sagebrush, um, grass cover between the patches of sage, and also forb cover, um, because their chicks eat lots of bugs and seeds as they're growing. And then prairie dogs obviously like to keep their grass short so that they can see predators. Um, and so they don't let much grow. They don't let sagebrush grow. Um, they want to keep that really clipped down so that they can see predators. Um, so in Grasses National Park, both of these species occupy the Frenchman River Valley. Um, and so it often was coming up, well, how do we manage for sage grouse when we know that we want to encourage sagebrush to grow, but also manage for prairie dogs when we know that they have the complete opposite requirements. So there must be something we can do um, to be able to have both of these animals on the landscape. And I will just point out that sage grouse do, one of our leks is on a prairie dog colony, so they do use that habitat, but it's not used for nesting or brood rearing, usually. Um, so, something we did, and it was, it's actually on the first one in Appendix B that I showed you, is this um, decision tool for, uh, I'll just read the title, Devel Development of Habitat Mapping and Decision Support Tool for Greater Sage Grouse and Black-Tailed Prairie Dog. Um, and this was completed for the park by the Saskatchewan Research Council. Um, they looked at things like current sagebrush cover, soil types that would allow us to know the potential for sagebrush cover, um, also the potential for a prairie dog colony to be in that area if their burrows would be stable, um, and the, those sorts of things. And so what came out of that at the highest level is this map that tells us, okay, so we've got gray areas that aren't really good for either of the species, so we're not going to do much management for either of them in those. Um, blue is has high potential for prairie dogs, but low potential for greater sage grouse. Um, and you can see these outlined areas here are current prairie dog colonies in the park, so most of those fall on blue, which is good. Shows that their model worked, so that's great. Um, high this green is high for greater sage growth, but low for black-tailed prairie dog. Uh, so all this green here could be really good, suitable habitat for greater sage growth. Um, and then pink is high for both. So in those pink areas, we would just have to make a decision about which species in that specific spot are we more interested in managing for. Um, so from this kind of high-level information, 
Um, I was able to combine that with, so what the um, decision tool provided us was a rank for sage grouse uh, suitability and also a rank for uh, sage brush potential. And also a map that showed us where current high density sage brush was, so we don't need to worry about that. Um, and then other areas where there's the potential for sagebrush but is currently hay fields. So all of the colored, the red on here are currently hay fields in Grafton National Park. Um, those were established long before the park was a park. Um, there were ranchers living in this area for, um, I don't know if I'd say 100 years, but at the time of the park creation, probably at least 90. Um, and so the uh, river floods, and it was really awesome for hay, obviously for putting up feed for their cows. Um, so through this tool, I was able to go through and kind of pick hay fields where it had a really high suitability for greater sage grouse and a high probability of establishing sage brush. Um, and so one of the things that we're going to do, hopefully in the next few years, is restore some of these hay fields, see if we can actually do it. Um, there's been lots of upland grassland restoration in the park, but not very much or any hayfield restoration. Um, and especially not anything that was trying to get a sagebrush plat to grow. So we're going to try to figure out if we can do that um, and kind of how expensive it'll be and how long it'll take, that sort of thing. And so that is, again, an action item on our Pathway Species Action Plan. Uh, the second one on the list there. Um, so, the targets that we're going for with that habitat restoration, so sagebrush in Grasslands National Park, we want more than 10% cover of sagebrush. We also want the height to be 40 to 80 centimeters. Um, so, you can imagine it might take 10 or 20 years before our hay field looks like that, because it takes sagebrush a long time to grow. Um, grass cover, we want 15%. Um, <coughs> and height more than 18%, and then for cover we want greater than 10%. Um, so those are kind of the targets we're after with this hayfield restoration project. And the other thing that the park's been working on is enhancement of existing native habitat. So um, there were some habitat assessments done in 2014 to 2017, and what we found out was that Sagebrush cover is well below the 10% threshold that we're after across most of the west block and most of the east block. Um, and also forb cover is really low in the east block. So um, we've got some strategies that we're trying to use to kind of bring those numbers up. So one of the things we've done is habitat enhancement um, where we've uh, actually gone in and planted sagebrush plants <coughs> where there wasn't high enough cover. Um, also, they've done some seeding of forbs to try to get that forb cover to increase um, beneficial categorizing, and I'll talk about that in quite a bit more detail later on. Um, just using cows to get in there, and um, forbs like disturbance a little bit, so if you get the cows in there, then your forb cover is going to increase, and sagebrush might also be more likely to grow if you've got some grazing, because then it reduces the competition from the grass. Um, Prescribed fire uh, is another tool that we can use. Uh, Grass National Park wasn't grazed for a long time and that was pretty problematic. Um, and so in some places we're using prescribed fire to just get rid of all that dead grass that's built up over the 20 or 30 years where there wasn't grazing um, to allow new grass to grow and forbs to flourish. Um, and then the last thing that we've done is fence marking and removal, so similar to managing um, using BMPs for pronghorn. Um, we do this for sage grouse so that the sage grouse don't fly into the fence and wring their neck, basically, break a wing, whatever. Um, so we've marked 40 kilometers of fence and actually taken out uh, over 50 kilometers of fence in the park. Um, so you can imagine that makes it a little bit challenging for our rancher partners who are grazing in the park. Um, but again, I will, I will talk about that more. Um, and I just, I'm on a fire, uh, I want people to like fire. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to show you this beautiful picture 
of these flowers that grew up after a prescribed fire was used in this area. And this is a key reason that we would use fire in sage grouse habitat because those forbs are really important for sage grouse. Um, and so by burning it off, the takes off the plant matter that's above the soil, lets everything at soil level and lower um, survive, so all the grass roots, everything like that is still living, and it allows that to really flourish following a fire. Um, and even, even in dry conditions, it's been shown that the grass can recover quite quickly, which is surprising to many people. Um, okay, so I'll get off my uh, soapbox there. Um, so population augmentation is something else we've been doing for sage grouse. Um, this is an interesting one. So starting in 2016, Grass National Park uh, formed a relationship with the Calgary Zoo. And the zoo went out and collected a few eggs from some different sage grouse nests. Um, took them back to the zoo and they're basically raising sage grouse at the zoo. Um, and um, it's, they have been really surprised actually at how successful their um, captive breeding program has been. Um, and so in fall of 2018, so just last fall, we were able to release, I think, 48 uh, sage grouse into the park. Um, so that's, that was pretty exciting for us. And I know that my, my boss, who lives down at the Dixon Ranch, um, just saw eight fly over her vehicle. And as of last spring, there were only five that we knew of. So it's looking promising um, that we're going to be able to keep that population uh, healthy in the west block of the park. Um, How many swift fox you got in the park? <laughs> That's an interesting question. Uh, I just saw a report. The zoo was out doing their surveys and they didn't detect any in the park. Um, they also do surveys on ranches around the park and there were some detected around the park. So they may be kind of, they, their home ranges are huge so they may be using the park but they just weren't detected there. Um, but I know there were swift fox releases. I don't know how long ago that was, but two miles from my house. Yeah, so there you go. Do you see them ever? Used to. Used to. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's one of the things <coughs> that is um, is on our action plan, but we don't have specific targets and specific actions for them at this time. So. Um, I think I've seen one outside the park, but I can't be 100% certain about it. Um, okay, so switching gears a little bit to prairie dogs. Um, so one of the things that we have done in the park, again, using this, um, the map looks a little bit different, but this is our uh, decision tool that the Saskatchewan Research Council made for us. And so using that tool, we could um, decide an area that was could be really beneficial for restoration for black tailed prairie dogs. So um, this area between, this is called Monument A and Monument B prairie dog colonies, was a crested wheatgrass field that had been cultivated. And so we've been working the past few years to restore that um, and then to promote, attempt to promote these colonies to move in and occupy that area as well. So we've planted native species out there, and we've mowed, and we've burned, and we've did some di done some different things. Um, still kind of in progress. You can see this is just a picture of the burn that happened out there. Um, yeah, not too much more to say about that one. So some of the active management things that we're doing. So we swab burrows, um, essentially looking for fleas that have uh, plague. So those burrow swab samples get sent off to a lab and they get tested for plague. Um, and then if plague's detected, Caitlin, you can correct me if I'm wrong. If plague's detected, then we dust. Or do we dust every year? I think we're dusting. Okay, so we're dusting with uh, delta mucrin dust that is um, killing the fleas. But we don't do that everywhere. We just do it in really targeted zones in the park to try to manage that plague from spreading. Um, I'm going to ignore this graph. Um, we're also experimenting with plague vaccines, so this has been something that they're also looking at in the states to attempt to manage um, sylvatic plague. Um, so getting the prairie dogs essentially to eat these vaccines and um, 
there's some preliminary research that does suggest that it helps um, prairie dogs to have better defenses against plague. So um, we are hoping to work towards testing that in the park. Um, okay, so I'm going to switch gears now to grazing for multiple species at risk. And so this is a project we have going, I've talked mostly about the west block, now I'm going to talk about the east block. There aren't any prairie dogs in the east block. Um, this is a project we have going with SODCAP um, through the Species at Risk Partnerships on Ag Land program. Um, and you all know this, I'm sure, but I'll say it again, a lot of species require disturbances, um, such as grazing and fire. Uh, so East Block, again, just to orient you where we are in the world. Um, so again, a big chunk of the park has this emergency protection order, which is this grid. Um, we've also got a lot of critical habitat for greater sage grouse, which is the blue kind of behind the um, map here. Um, the proposed boundary of the park is in dark black outline there. And the currently owned Grasslands National Park is in this green shaded color. So we've obviously got some chunks of land that are still managed by local ranchers. Um, and so because they were being impacted by critical habitat and EPO, it became really obvious that we should be working with them to um, promote habitat for greater sage grouse. And so our grazing program in the East Block went from a strictly permitted you get a set number of AUMs, you go in on this date, come out on this date, um, to a more collaborative process where we're trying to achieve specific habitat targets for different species. Um, and so we're calling this a grass bank because those producers now have access to grass in National Park. Um, the grass bank is the grass in the park essentially. Um, and so how this works, and this concept have, has been used in lots of other places. Um, there's one being piloted at Old Man on his back right now. There's um, the Matador Ranch in northern Montana has one. Um, so uh, what all of those places have in common is that they're trading forage for conservation benefits. Um, usually what happens is the producer gets a reduced fee for grazing on that, um, that chunk of land that's owned by an NGO or the federal government or whatever um, for so they get a reduced fee for doing things on their own land. So maybe they get a reduced fee for doing some habitat restoration, putting some cropland into native species, or managing some leafy spurge on their land uh, so they can get a reduced fee for those sorts of things. In Grasslands National Park, we've focused on um, managing the habitat for three different species, so greater sage grouse, chestnut collar long spurs, and sprags pivots. So the East Block, we don't have a lot of non-native um, areas. There's not, it was never cropped. Um, we don't have a lot of invasive species that we're too worried about. There are some, um, but the focus for this project was definitely managing habitat for these three species. Um, and so we use these results based agreements. And so basically, we've got very specific habitat targets. So. Uh, for greater sage grouse and uplands, we want our producers to achieve a uh, form cover of greater than 8% or visual obstruction readings of greater than 25% coverage of, <laughs> this is a long one, of at least two 5 centimeter segments. Um, so that's to get at the density of the sagebrush. Um, we've got target for sprigs pivots, so dead vegetation cover between 40 and 70% because they like nesting in that dead vegetation but they don't like too much vegetation because then it makes it hard for them to move around and feed. Um, litter load between 350 and 700 pounds per acre. Um, for chestnut hill at for example, bare ground, we want to achieve between 25 and 50% bare ground. Um, again, that's because they really like that bare ground habitat. They literally nest in really open areas and they'll often be found nesting next to like a cow paddy and that provides their protection from the elements and it can hide them from predators. Um, so that's kind of a um, unique thing that most producers aren't really interested in having their grassland look like that.
but at Grasslands National Park we want to make sure that we have this because then we make sure we have this species and we have McCown's long spurs and long goat curlews and other species that really like that kind of heavily, heavily used area. Um, so this is the framework, essentially how this program works. Um, so the park, we've got, um, we've got the grass. And so we provide an incentive to the rancher through a reduced grazing fee to achieve those targets that I just showed you. Um, sod cap. Do you guys all know what sod cap is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I thought you must. <laughs> um, so they provide the monitoring both on parkland and on the rancher's land um, so that we can determine whether or not we've met those targets in both of those areas. Um, and then SODCAP also basically feeds that information to stock growers who can then provide the cash payout to those ranchers for their um, kind of private crown lease land chunk of this project. Um, and we work together to develop a grazing plan to achieve our targets. So this is what it looks like. Um, this one here is one unit. So. The blue is the kind of crown lease, I, I just tend to call it the private land even though it's not exactly private. Um, and then this person has access to this whole area of Grasslands National Park. Um, and then in the pink is the same, they've got access to this area of the park. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we've been taking fences out. So he's got some uh, fences in here, but this area, I think there's one fence here and the rest of it's open. So you see that's 44 sections in this whole unit, so this is probably about 20, 22 sections that has no fences, and we want them to achieve targets. So that's why we're providing them that cash incentive. If they meet the targets, then they get a reduced fee, because it is quite a bit of extra work for them. Um, and getting back to the multi-species, so each section of this project area has been um, identified for one of the three species that we're interested in. So the pink ones have been designated for Sprague's pipits. The blue, the light dark, light and dark blue have been designated for greater sage grouse. And then the green, there's two sections here and there's another one section here um, that doesn't show on the map, are for chestnut color long spurs. Um, the long spur target is currently smaller just because it's kind of experimental. No one's really tried very hard to achieve those targets before um, and it again you think this is a lot of work but then trying to get your cows to stay in two sections for an extra month is really hard especially if you don't have a fence here to try to keep them in so um, I don't know if Mel ever saw either of them I was told that one of the field techs would often see our partner covered it from head to toe in dust on his horse because he was Every day he'd be out trying to push his cows back into the longs for target area, just because it was so hard to keep them in there. Um, do you not allow electric fence? Well, we Temporary. do. Yeah, we um, we can use electric fence, temporary electric fence. They chose not to use that option. We have done that in the West Block a little bit, um, and we have done it in the park down here with our with Miles Anderson. Um, so we have done it. But that particular partner chose not to for this one. Maybe next year he'll decide to try it because it was so much work. Um, and this this one that's not on the map is actually its own little tiny pasture. <laughs> so that one's quite easy. Just dump them in and hope that they don't crawl over any fences. Break the gate down. Um, so how? So we actually go out and measure for these things on each of those areas. So the light blue. For example, the greater sage grouse overflow, we would go out and measure those three targets in every section here that's light blue. We're measuring for those specific targets. And the same thing for the orange for the Sprague's pivots, we would be measuring for those things in the pink squares um, so that we can get an idea of whether or not we've actually achieved our targets. Um, and I guess I took out the slides about how these were chosen. So 
the way these were selected, we did some desktop exercises with uh, ArcGIS, basically looking at what we thought was there, um, and kind of had a preliminary selection for each <coughs> section. But then um, Kelly and Nathan actually went out, and I don't, there were probably other people that went out. You probably went out. No, it was not Okay, Kelly and Nathan actually rode many miles through here. <coughs> to try to make sure that what they had selected matched kind of what they were seeing on the landscape. So there is quite a bit of groundwork that needs to be done to make sure that we get we get this right. Um, so again, this is what the monitoring looks like for sage grouse. So you go out with a, a measuring tape, run it out, take your measurements, um, and we specifically put those in um, sites that were identified as overflow, so that's why this is blue. Those would be expected to be able to achieve higher sagebrush cover. Um, and so that we, we wouldn't put it, say, in an upland area because we know that that wouldn't have even a possibility of having high sagebrush cover. So we spe specifically put our monitoring points where we would hope that we could achieve those targets. And similarly for the uplands, for pivots and long spurs, we put them in this pink, which is showing upland areas. So in this particular section here, we wouldn't have put it down here in the creek. That would be maybe expected to have more sagebrush cover, which is not great for pivots and long spurs. Um, so this is the output we get from this kind of monitoring. Um, it can tell us where we're achieving the targets and kind of what we need to keep working on in the future. So the green shows sections where all of the targets for that species were met. The yellow shows sections where some of the targets were met. And the red shows sections where none of the targets were met. Um, this one in particular has, um, I think there's a holding corral here. Um, and they use this quite heavily, but during um, brief time periods. So this one we're going to have to think more carefully about how and if we can achieve the targets there. Um, so, yeah, we can take this information and going forward into 2019, we can say, well, we're going to focus some different strategies here. Uh, we're not going to worry so much about this because it looks pretty good right now, but we still want you grazing in there. Um, this one, maybe we need more grazing because uh, the litter was too high here. Um, so that's, that's the kind of information we're getting and we can really work collaboratively together with our ranching partners to achieve these targets. Um, and so going back to the population and distribution objectives, which is that sheet you have, the goal for Sprague's Pivots for the park is 45 singing males per 100 hectares. Sodcap did some point counts for us where they went out and actually counted pivots in those pink zones, which were designated specifically for pivots. And we're currently at about 42 pivots per 100 hectares, so we're not quite at the goal, but we're definitely in, in a good, Good range for that. Um, and I'll just show you really quickly. Um, so the Sprague's Pivots targets we've achieved. There's the mouse. Um, so the dead vegetation cover, the target was 40 to 70 percent. Um, measured on the ground, so this was actually out there with their frame looking at the ground and saying how much of this is dead vegetation. And so that was on average across that whole area, uh, about 65% dead vegetation. And so some would have been higher and some would have been lower. We achieved that target at 52% of our sections that were designated for pivots. Um, similarly for litter load, we achieved that target of 350 to 700 pounds per acre at 44% percent of those sections that were designated for Sprague's pivots. Um, bare ground, the target was less than 20 percent bare ground, so looking at a frame on the ground, how much of that has bare ground showing. Um, measured was 10.4 percent, um, so it's less than that target, and this one we did the best on, um, probably just because there wasn't grazing there for so long that there wasn't an opportunity for there to be much bare ground. Um, as you guys said earlier though, we, we do, we are interested in having some bare ground, so um, we don't want to say zero bare ground because that's, that's not going to be great for most species either. Um, 
Greater Sage Ghosts. Um, the worst one that we really need to work really hard on is increasing forb cover. And that's probably just going to come from some more patchy grazing in these areas. Because um, if you graze it too hard, if they're really hammering those riparian areas because there's limited water, then you're going to suppress everything. But if you're not in there at all, then you're not going to get many forbs growing either. So we need to work a little bit harder on that one. The other ones were in the East Block, we're doing pretty good. Safe brush density and grass height are we're above 80% achieved for those two. So I won't show you the, um, there's targets like this for long spurs and then for greater sage grass uplands, but I don't need to show you those. Um, so future directions for this grazing program, um, we would like to get more into a shifting mosaic and incorporating fire so that if we can use fire on the landscape then we're going to be um, opening that habitat up for long spurs and burring owls and count long spurs and all these other species that like that kind of habitat. And then um, cattle, as well as bison in the West Block, would be attracted to that fire and kind of maintain that lower vegetation structure for a short amount of time. And then eventually they kind of move off of it and go somewhere else. And that takes a couple of years and grows back. And we burn somewhere else. And then that same cycle starts over again. And we can get this kind of movement around uh, Grasses National Park where we've got habitat for all the species. It's just not in the same place every single year. Um, so I should point out this green, for example, with that shifting mosaic idea. That green for the Tessendara long spur is going to move at some point in the future. Because we don't want the cows to be hammering that year after year after year, because then you get your changes in the plant community, you can get erosion problems. Um, so we will we'll achieve those targets as best we can, and if, we, if we're happy with the achieved or if we're starting to see problems there, then we'll move it somewhere else, maybe over here, where this is a pivot target, and then this one can recover over a number of years and become a pivot target. So that's kind of the idea of this shifting. And if we had fire, it would be really easy to get this to be a long spur target. Um, okay. So